In question four, we need to find the x coordinate of the stationary point on this curve. So we need to apply the product rule to find the y dx. So we differentiate the first, we get two and we keep the second e to the three x plus we keep the first and we differentiate the second. The derivative of e to the three x is three e to the three x. Now we can factor out the e to the three x and I'm left with 2 plus 6x plus 15, which further simplifies into e to the 3x, 6x plus 17. Now we know that for a stationary point, it means that the y dx is 0, and therefore we have that 6x plus 17 must be 0. Now e to the 3x can never be 0, and therefore we neglect that part and this leads to x being minus 17 over 6. In question 2, we start off by being asked to show that 8 cos theta is equal to 3 cos x theta may be written in the form of sine 2 theta is k, where k is a constant to be found. So let's start by writing out the given equation. We've got 8 cos theta is 3 cos x theta. So I will write the cos x theta as 1 over sine theta and then we can cross multiply to get 8 sine theta cos theta is equal to 3. Now I can divide both sides by 4 and I get that uh, 2 sine theta cos theta is equal to 3 over 4 and we recognize the left hand side as simply sine 2 theta which is equal to 3 over 4 and therefore the constant k is simply 3 quarters. In B, it says, hence find the smallest positive solution for this equation. We need to give our answers in degrees to one decimal place. Now, solving sine of 2 theta is 3 over 4, we start by finding the principal value, which is shift sine of 3 over 4. This gives an answer of 48.590. I'm only interested in the first positive solution. So I will simply say that 2 theta is 48.590, which leads to theta being 24.3 to one decimal place. In question three, the first part is to find in its simpler form the integral of 2x minus 5 to the 7. So I can start by simply noting that since 2x minus 5 is a linear expression in x, I can Find the integral by increasing the power by 1, so to the power of 8, dividing by the new power and also dividing by the derivative of the bracket, which is simply 2 plus c, since it's an indefinite integral, which simplifies to 2x minus 5 to the power of 8 over 16 plus c. In II, we need to show by algebraic integration that this integral leads to ln of a for some rational constant a to be found. So we are looking at the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of 4 sine x over 1 plus 2 cos x. Now we know that the derivative of the denominator here is minus 2 sine x and it would be just great if we had this to be the numerator of the expression to be integrated so I can actually split the 4 sine x into minus 2 sine x inside and the negative 2 outside over 1 plus 2 cos x dx and now that the numerator is a derivative of the denominator this simply means that the integral is minus 2 ln of 1 plus 2 cos x from 0 to pi over 3. We are obviously in radian mode because it's an integral. I will substitute the upper limit to get minus 2 ln of 1 plus 2 cos of pi over 3 minus minus 2 ln of 1 plus 2 cos of 0. Now this leads to minus 2 ln 2 plus 2 ln 3, which I can write as 2 brackets ln of 3 minus ln of 2. I can combine the ln of 3 minus ln of 2 as simply 2 ln of 3 over 2, 
and the 2 can go up to give me a length of 3 over 2 squared and therefore we conclude that this is ln of 9 over 4 and therefore the rational constant a is simply 9 over 4. In question 4 we are told that the surface area a is given by this equation here where p is a positive constant and t is the number of days after the start of the study. Now initially we have 30 square meters of surface and we need to show that p is 2.4 so I will actually use the fact that when T is 0, then capital A is 30, and I will substitute. This means that 30 is equal to ATP over P plus 4. This is because E to the 0 is 1. I will cross multiply leading to 30P plus 120 is ATP, and therefore 120 is 50P. So 120 over 50 is P, which turns out to be 2.4 as required. In part B, we need to find the value of capital T, giving our answer in one decimal place. I will be using this second piece of information. We have 50 squared meters of surface, capital T days after the start of the study. So, what we know now is that when T is capital T, then the surface area capital A is 50. This means that we've got 50 is equal to 80 times the P, which was 2.4, e to the 0 0.15 capital T over 2.4 e to the 0 0.15 capital T plus 4. I will cross multiply to get 120 e to the 0 0.15 t plus 200 is equal to 192 e to the 0 0.15 t. Now this leads to 200 being equal to 72 e to the 0 0.15 t. So 200 over 72 is equal to e to the 0 0.15 t. I can get rid of the E by taking a len of both sides. So a len of 200 over 72 is equal to 0 0.15 capital T. So 1 over 0 0.15 a len of 200 over 72 is equal to capital T. And this gives an answer of 6.8 days. In C, we are told that uh, we need to find the maximum possible surface area of the pond. So we need to consider the behavior of capital A as T tends to infinity. So we say that as T tends to infinity, then the capital A tends to 80 times 2.4 e to the 0 0.15 T over 2.4 e to the 0 0.15 t. The reason for that is that if we go back to the original equation for a, as t grows larger and larger, then the 4 becomes insignificant and essentially all the information uh, arises from the exponential terms. So the capital A will be tending towards this and you can see that the 2.4 e to the 0 0.15 t cancels out and this is simply 80 so the maximum value for a the maximum area is 80 square meters in question 5 we've got the curve described here for this equation We've got P being a cut on the x-axis and we need to show that P lies in the interval of minus 1.25 and negative 1.2. So we need to look for a change of sign. So we simply say that when x is minus 1.25, we substitute into the equation for y and we get y to be minus 0 0.940. We then substitute x is negative 1.2 we get that y is 0 0.215 and therefore we conclude that there is a change of sign and y is continuous 
hence we've got a root in this interval. In part b, we need to use a iterative formula given here, starting with x1 being 6 to find the value of x2 to 40 piece, and then continue this to get the x coordinate of q. q is the second cut on the x axis to four decimal places. So if we start with x1 is 6, we simply put this on our calculator and we apply the iterative process. So the next iteration gives me 6.3637. And if I keep doing that, I keep pressing the equal button on my calculator until the value, the root stabilizes, we see that this leads to x being 6.4142. In C, we're told that we have a maximum point at M and we need to use calculus to find the X coordinate of M. So we will be using differentiation here. I will start by writing the original equation for y. So y is 6 ln of 2x plus 3 minus a half x squared plus 4. So we will find dy dx. So dy dx will be 6 times the derivative of ln of 2x plus 3 is the derivative of the inside. The inside is 2x plus 3. So the derivative of that is 2. And the derivative of ln is 1 over, so 6 times 2 over 2x plus 3 minus a half times 2x, which simplifies to 12 over 2x plus 3 minus x. Now we know that at point m dy dx is 0 as it's a maximum point, so setting dy dx to be 0 leads to 12 over 2x plus 3 is equal to x. So if I cross multiply, I get 12 is 2x squared plus 3x. I'll collect everything on the right hand side to give me 0 is 2x squared plus 3x minus 12. And now I can use the quadratic formula to find the values for x. So it's minus b plus minus b squared minus 4ac square root over 2a. Now this gives two answers, gives us the answer of minus 3 plus minus root of 105 and all of it over 4. Now we need to make a choice between the plus and the minus. If we look at the given uh, graph here, we can see that the x coordinate of m is certainly positive. So we can simply say that at m x is positive and therefore x is minus 3 plus 105 and all of it over 4. This is the x coordinate of point M. In question 6 we are being told that f of x is 5x minus 3 over x minus 4 and we need to show using calculus that this is a decreasing function. I uh, will start by finding f dash of x and I'm applying the quotient rule here. So I differentiate the top and I keep the bottom minus keep the top, differentiate the bottom over the bottom squared, x minus 4 all squared. This leads to 5x minus 20 minus 5x plus 3 and all of it over x minus 4 squared which simplifies to minus 17 over x minus 4 squared. Now we know that x minus 4 squared is greater than 0 for x greater than 4, the domain of this function, and therefore this means that minus 17 over x minus 4 squared will be less than 0 for all values of x, and therefore we conclude that the derivative will be negative and hence f of x is a decreasing function. In part b we need to find f inverse, so we follow the usual approach of starting by writing y is equal to 5x minus 3 over x minus 4. I will interchange x and y, so x is 5y minus 3 over y minus 4. I will cross multiply to get xy minus 4x is 5y minus 3, which leads to uh, 3 minus 4x is 5y minus xy, 
and therefore 3 minus 4x is y brackets 5 minus x so we've got 3 minus 4x over 5 minus x is equal to y and therefore f inverse of x is 3 minus 4x over 5 minus x this is not the end of the story we also need to find the domain of f inverse and as always i'll be using the fact that the domain of f inverse is the range of f of x so i will plot f and based on that i will find its range so this is the equation for f of x we can see that we've got asymptotes at x is 4 it's the point where the denominator is 0 and therefore we've got division by 0 it's an asymptote the function is not defined for the horizontal asymptote we consider the behavior of y as x tends to infinity and we can see that the minus 3 and the minus 4 are insignificant so y tends to 5x over x or simply y goes to 5 so the horizontal asymptote is at y is 5 we can also see that when x is 0 y turns out to be 3 over 4 and when y is 0 we've got that 5x minus 3 is 0 which leads to x being 3 over 5 so i've got the cuts on the two axes i can now proceed in sketching my graph it certainly belongs in the reciprocal family of curves. So I will start by drawing my asymptotes at y is equal to 5 and uh, x is equal to 4. So there it is. Let me label my asymptotes. This is y is 5. This is x is 4. And we've got a cut here on the positive uh, y-axis and the positive x-axis, the 3 over 4 and the 3 over 5. And we've got this part here on the right of the vertical asymptote. Now we'll apply the restriction. We are told that the domain was x greater than 4. So based on that, I will come here and I say that the part of the curve that's of interest is this part here. That's the, the part of the curve that represents the function. And therefore, we can see that the range of this is everything above the horizontal asymptote. So we can see that the range of f is y belongs to the reals and y is greater than 5, which is exactly the domain of the inverse. It has to be given in terms of x. So we say that x belongs to the reals, x is greater than 5. In part c, we need to show that uh, f of f of x is given here, and we need to deduce the range of f of f. So I will start by finding an expression for the composite function f of f of x. So f of f of x, I start by applying f of x once. So it's f of 5x minus 3 over x minus 4 and i apply this into f so it's 5 times 5x minus 3 over x minus 4 minus 3 and all of it over 5x minus 3 over x minus 4 minus 4 now in order to simplify this fraction i will multiply everything by x minus 4 to get rid of the denominators in the numerator and the denominator so multiply everything by x minus 4 which leads to 5 brackets 5x minus 3 minus 3 brackets x minus 4 over 5x minus 3 minus 4 brackets x minus 4 I will expand to get 25x minus 15 minus 3x plus 12 over 5x minus 3 minus 4x plus 16 and this leads to 22x minus 3 over x plus 13. This is an expression for f of f of x 
Now we need to give the domain as always. So the domain is simply the domain of f of x because it depends on f of x. So we simply say that x belongs to the reals and x is greater than 4. And then in ii, we need to deduce the range of f of f. So even though it's only going to be worth 2 marks probably, I will still need to go through the process of sketching this. So we have established that f of f of x is 22x minus 3 over x plus 13. As always, I will start with the asymptotes. So we've got an asymptote at x is minus 13. As x tends to infinity, we have said that the negative 3 and the 13 are insignificant, so y tends to 22x over x, or simply 22. So y tends to 22, and therefore the horizontal asymptote is at y is 22. We can also see that when x is 0, y is minus 3 over 13, and when y is 0, we've got that 22x minus 3 is 0, and therefore x is 3 over 22, and so we're now ready to sketch the graph. Here, we know that this function is defined for x greater than 4, so if I draw my pair of axes here, I will start by putting the horizontal and the vertical asymptote, so at x is minus 13, and at y is 22. So this is the y is 22, and this is the x is minus 13. Now, I will draw this part here. This is what the graph looks like. It's cutting at 3 over 22 and minus 3 over 13. Obviously, over here, it's going to be something like this. And I will now apply the restriction that x is greater than 4. So 4 is somewhere here. So this is the point to the right of which the function operates. So when uh, x is 4, y turns out to be 5. And the function is this part here. So we can see that the range of this is between 5 and 22 with both endpoints not being included. So we can simply say that the range is between 5 and 22. So the range of the composite function f of f of x is 5 less than y less than 22. In question 7, we've got the graph of f of x. It's a half, the modulus of 2x plus 7 minus 10. We need to state the coordinates of the vertex v. Now we know that the vertex is where the modulus vanishes when 2x plus 7 is 0. So we start by saying that at v 2x plus 7 is 0 which means that uh, x is minus 7 over 2 and when the 2x plus 7 is 0, the y is simply negative 10, and therefore v has coordinates minus 7 over 2, comma, negative 10. It uh, makes sense to actually go back to my diagram here and add this information. So we've got the vertex at minus 7 over 2, comma, negative 10. It also makes sense to identify each line segment with its individual equation without involving the modulus sign. So, on the right hand side, we've got y is equal to a half brackets 2x plus 7 minus 10, which simplifies to x minus 13 over 2. And on the left, we've got y is minus a half 2x plus 7 minus 10, which simplifies to minus x minus 27 over 2. And that will be useful when we come to part B, which says solve using algebra this inequality here. So I will actually add the line a third x plus 1 on my diagram. It's a line that cuts through the positive axis at 1, and it's certainly less steep than this one. So it probably looks 
something like this. So it's cutting at one here. It has equation y is a third x plus one. We are looking for the straight line being below the V-shaped graph. So I want to find the two points of intersection. And since I want the line to be below, I will choose to be to the right of this x value and to the left of this x value. So in order to proceed, I will be equating a third x plus one, which with each of these two straight lines in order to find the critical values for x. So we start by saying we need to solve minus x, minus 27 over 2 is equal to a third x plus 1. I will multiply throughout by 6, leading to minus 6x, minus 81 is 2x plus 6 and therefore minus 87 is equal to 8x. So x is minus 87 over 8. And the other x value will be given by x minus 13 over 2 is equal to a third x plus 1. Again, multiplying by 6 leads to 6x minus 39 is 2x plus 6. And therefore we have 4x is 45. So x is 45 over 4. Now if we go back to the diagram here, we see that this point here is the minus 87 over 8. And this is the 45 over 4. We said that we wanted the straight line to be below. So we are to the left of minus 87 over 8 and to the right of 45 over 4. So our answer, I will give it in set notation x such that x less than or equal to minus 87 over 8 union x such that x is greater than or equal to 45 over 4. Now for part c we need to sketch y is the modulus of f of x and we need to state the coordinates of the local maximum point and each local minimum point. To do that, I will do some preparatory work on the existing diagram here. I will find the cuts on the x-axis here. So to find the cuts on the x-axis, we set the y to be 0. So at this point here, x minus 13 over 2 is 0. So x is 13 over 2. And at this point over here, we get that minus x minus 27 over 2 is 0 so minus 27 over 2 is equal to x we've got the cuts on the x-axis now we need to consider on what exactly this transformation is doing well it's reflecting any part that lies below the x-axis so it appears above so this v here will be reflected up so we will end up seeing a w something like this and the vertex v will now go to minus 7 over 2 comma 10. So I have drawn the graph here. We've got the cuts on the x-axis. We've got the vertex. I have left the original just to show the reflection along the x-axis. And our final answer should be without the bottom part. So it should be this W-shaped graph. Question 8, we are told that the amount of antibiotic X milligrams in the patient's bloodstream T hours after the dose was given is found to satisfy this equation. And we need to show that this can be written in this form where P and Q are constants to be found. So I will actually start by saying that if we have X to be P, Q to the minus T, I could take logs of both sides. So log X base 10 is log of p q to the negative t base 10 which can be written as log of p base 10 plus log of q to the negative t base 10 so log of x base 10 is log of p base 10 minus t log q base 10 and we are given that log of x base 10 is equal to 2.74 minus 0 0.079 t 
So we can compare the 2.7 for the constant is the log of P base 10 and the log of Q base 10 is the 0 0.079. So we can say that log of P base 10 is 2.74, log of Q base 10 is 0 0.079. And so P is 10 to the 2.74, which turns out to be 550. And Q is 10 to the 0 0.079, which turns out to be 1.2. And therefore the model is X is 550 times 1.2 to the negative T. In B, we are told that with reference to the equation given, interpret the value of the constant P. Well, we know that when T is 0, 1.2 to the power of 0 will be 1, and therefore X will be 550. So this is the dose, the amount of antibiotic in the patient's bloodstream at the start. In C, we need to use calculus to find the value of dx dt when t is 5 for a slightly different uh, equation here. x is 400 times 1.4 to the negative t. So I will start by writing out the expression here. x is 400 times 1.4 to the negative t. Now, to find the derivative, I'm using the rule that says that if y is a to the x, then dy dx is a to the x ln a, and therefore dx dt is 400. Now, to differentiate 1.4 to the negative t, I've got the extra hurdle of instead of having t, I've got negative t. So I multiply by the derivative of negative t, which is negative 1, times 1.4 to the negative t times ln of 1.4. And I can now substitute uh, t is 5. So when t is 5, we get 400 times negative 1 times 1 1.4 to the negative 5 ln of 1.4. And this turns out to be minus 25 milligrams per hour. In question 9, we need to solve the given equation. We are in a radian mode between 0 and pi. So we've got 2 sec squared x minus 3 tan x is 2. I will write sec squared as 1 plus tan squared in order to obtain a quadratic in tan. So if I expand, I get 2 plus 2 tan squared x minus 3 tan x is equal to 2. So the 2s will cancel out. I can factor out the tan x to give me tan x brackets 2 tan x minus 3, which means that either tan of x is 0 or tan of x is 3 over 2. Now the principal value for tan x is 0 is shift tan of 0 which is 0 and the principal value for tan x is 3 over 2 is shift tan of 3 over 2 which is 0 0.98279 and therefore we've got that x is pi k and x is 0 0.98279 plus pi k. Now we are between 0 and pi. 0 is not included, but pi is included in the domain for x. So the solutions for x are 0 0.983 and pi. In II, we need to prove the following identity. So I will start from the left-hand side. We've got sine 3 theta over sine theta minus cos of 3 theta over cos theta. I will express over a common denominator of sine theta cos theta. So I will have sine 3 theta cos theta minus cos 3 theta sine theta. Now let's recall that sine of a minus b is equal to sine a cos b 
minus cos a sine b. So it's easy to see that 3 theta is our a and theta is our b. And therefore, this can be written as sine of 3 theta minus theta over sine theta cos theta. So in the numerator, we've got sine of 2 theta. And in the denominator, we've got sine theta cos theta. Now, the double angle for sine 2 theta is giving us 2 sine theta cos theta in the numerator, which will cancel out with sine theta cos theta in the denominator. And therefore, I'm left with 2, which is the right hand side as required. In question 10, we are being given that x is y e to the 2y, and we need to show that the y dx is given by this expression. So I will start by finding dx dy. I'm using the product rule. I differentiate y. I'm left with 1 e to the 2y. Plus, I keep y. The derivative of e to the 2y is 2e to the 2y. So this is e to the 2y brackets 1 plus 2y. Now, we know that x is y e to the 2y. So x over y is e to the 2y. So going back to the expression for dx dy, I will replace e to the 2y with x over y. And I've got the 1 plus 2y. So if I take the reciprocal of both sides, I get dy dx to be y over x brackets 1 plus 2y as required. Now in part b, we are told that the straight line with equation x is k is cutting at exactly two points and we need to find the range of possible values of k. So to do that, let's consider first of all that we are looking at the vertical line and we're looking at the cuts. So a vertical line has an undefined gradient. That's crucial. It's the starting point. So the gradient is undefined. And since the gradient is given by the dy dx expression, we can see that this will be undefined when the denominator is zero. So we've got an undefined gradient when x is zero or when 1 plus 2y is 0. So if 1 plus 2y is 0, this means that y is minus a half, which makes x being minus a half e to the 2 times minus a half, which is minus a half e to the minus 1, which is minus 1 over 2e. Now, these two values for x are essentially the limits for k, because if we go back to our uh, graph, we can see that when x is minus 1 over 2a, we are exactly tangential at that point, and therefore there is one point of intersection. And when x is 0, it's the y-axis, and we again have one point of intersection, and anything in between is what we are looking for for 2 distinct cuts. So this means that we can conclude that k should be between minus 1 over 2e and 0.